Hi there, Chris Tubnacup, Motor Legends. This is the second in our series of what we're calling our how to buy guides. And this time around, we're gonna be talking about motorcycle jackets. Now clearly a helmet is the most important item that you can buy from a safety perspective. It's the only item that you are required to wear from a legal standpoint. But a jacket is the most important element that you can wear as far as comfort's concerned. And I'm gonna come back later to talk about why comfort is such an important concept. But today what that means is I'm not gonna be talking about the relative merits of different brands. We're not gonna be comparing one brand versus another, but rather we're gonna be talking about different methods of constructing motorcycle jackets. I'm going to explain all the different styles of jacket and I'm gonna talk about what riding each jacket is designed for, what kind of riders and what conditions. Now, as I've mentioned already, comfort is immensely important if you're to ride safely, but it's a slightly modern concept. Back in the day when I was first learning to ride, comfort wasn't much discussed. And that was first because nobody who rode a motorcycle expected to be comfort. And I suppose it might be true, I don't count myself in this, but it's true that back in the day, bikers were a slightly tougher bunch. But it was also born, this attitude was also born out of necessity because frankly, the gear that was available to motorcyclists back then was pretty rubbish. And when the temperature dropped, guess what? You got cold. When it rained, you just got wet and when it was hot, you got sweaty. It was just part of the motorcycling experience. Nobody had heard of Gore-Tex and Outlast was something that was used by astronauts. But we now realize the importance of what we call passive safety. And that's all about riding in a totally relaxed and calm and comfortable manner on the bike so that you can put all of your attention, all of your concentration into staying alive. Now, some people prefer the concept of wearing ever more protective gear. So thicker leather, airbag vest and so on. But we prefer the notion of wearing gear that will make the chances of having an accident in the first place less likely. Because when you're riding comfortably, calmly, you're totally relaxed, there's a much better chance that you'll see that white van hidden behind the hedge that's gonna pull out and try and kill you. Let's kick off with leather jackets. Now, if you're the kind of rider who rides in all conditions, come rain or shine, the solution as far as the jacket's concerned is going to be a textile jacket of some description. That does not mean that here at Motor Legends we are in any way against leather garments, against leather jackets. Leather is supremely comfortable. Technically what happens is you wear it, it molds to the body. So when it gets wet, it expands a little bit. When it dries out, it contracts. Eventually it adopts your shape. And of course, leather is naturally strong. It's naturally abrasion resistant. So if you do end up going down the road, then it's very, sure, very reassuring to know that you're wearing a leather jacket. And of course, the big thing about a leather jacket is almost anybody looks cooler when they're wearing leather. See what I mean? But the window for effectively wearing leather on the bike is a fairly narrow one. And that's for a number of reasons. Leather is not naturally very breathable. So when it's hot, the sweat can't escape. Sweating is the, is the body's way of cooling itself down, but the sweat can't escape. So you're not gonna cool down effectively. You're gonna end up with a pool of sweat inside the jacket on a hot day. Ironically, it's exactly the same reason that means that leather is not particularly good in the winter, because in the winter when it's cold, you want to, you will want to put layers underneath. You might wanna wear a heated jacket, but you'll be wanting to insulate heat inside the jacket. Now, you've got that heat being trapped. It cannot escape. So because it cannot escape, again, you're gonna end up with sweat on the inside. When the temperature drops even further, that's not very nice. The wind chill factor can make you feel very cold. The cold inner side of the jacket will cause heat to escape from the body even faster because that heat will travel far faster through a wet medium than a dry medium. So in essence, you don't wanna be wearing a leather jacket when it's really cold. But the real Achilles heel of leather is that it's pretty much useless in the rain. So if we imagine, a chamois leather. This is the leather jacket. The bucket is water, obviously it's symbolizing rain. We drop it in and this is what happens to your leather jacket. It just absorbs the, the rain. And what happens, that means that it becomes quite quickly, certainly in heavy rain, becomes uncomfortable to wear because the jacket will get heavy, you will start to chafe, 
The wind chill factor again will make you feel even colder. It's just not a nice way of riding. So much as we love leather, it is simply not appropriate for riding in the rain. A leather jacket is not what you want to be wearing in the wet. Leather is, in truth, it's kind of a lifestyle choice. You wear leather largely because, or not largely, but partly because you just want to wear leather. As I've mentioned, it is true, leather is protective, but it's also, as we've mentioned, very cool, very sexy. On the right day, it is lovely to ride in a leather jacket. And that day will be one where it's mid temperature, not too hot, not too cold, and there's no rain on the horizon. But what I would contend is that in the UK, there are probably more days where a leather jacket is not appropriate than there are days when it's inappropriate. So if you're going to have one jacket, then in our view, it just shouldn't be a leather jacket. I suppose if you're someone, if you've got a Harley or a Bonneville, you only go out on sunny weekends, you only go out when the long-term forecast the next seven days says there's no rain in sight. If you're that kind of rider, then go for it. A leather jacket is going to be perfect for almost all of your riding. But if you ride long distances, if you go out in all weathers, if you commute, you are going to need a textile jacket of some description. So what we're going to do now, we're going to talk through all the different styles of textile jacket. I'm going to kick off with mesh jackets, go on to discuss jackets with no waterproof membranes, so lightweight summer jackets. We'll then talk about jackets with removable waterproof membranes, the kind of jacket that's, that are often associated with adventure riding. We'll go on and talk about drop liner jackets, wax cotton jackets, and we'll finish off talking about laminated jackets. Mesh jackets, let's talk about mesh jackets. Mesh jackets are normally pretty light in weight. You've got no thermal lining, they don't make any pretense to keep you warm. You've got no waterproof qualities, so obviously they're no good in the rain. And the theory is very simple. As you're riding along on a hot day, the cool air can pass through these mesh panels that cools the body down by the same token. We've already mentioned the importance of sweating, the body's natural way of cooling itself down. That sweat can escape through these mesh panels. So a jacket like this is very cool to wear in hot conditions, but in truth, they are designed for the very hottest conditions. No one ever really invented the mesh jacket for UK riders. As a UK rider, if you go touring, then certainly I can see absolutely a case because if you find yourself in the south of France or Italy or Spain where it's going to be very hot, then a mesh jacket really comes into its own. Normally, the way that a mesh jacket is constructed, you'll have a very simple nylon structure to the jacket. You will then have mesh panels in certain parts. This is a particularly nice mesh jacket, it comes from the French brand Helston's. So we've got mesh all the way down the front, mesh up the arms and mesh in the back. Personally, however, I've never worn, and I've been riding for some 30 years, I have never in the UK worn a mesh jacket. And I would suggest that while some might like a mesh jacket, most of us don't need a mesh jacket over here. The temperatures have got to really be at, in at, at least the mid twenties before you're gonna derive any benefit from a mesh jacket. And unfortunately, we've got to be honest about it, that doesn't happen a whole lot over here in the UK. So for many, my view is that a simple, unlined, non-waterproof jacket is going to serve their purposes just as well. It's going to flow almost as much air, but it's going to be much more practical, much more versatile, probably more, look much better off the bike. So as I mentioned, mesh jackets are really for the hottest of climates. If, however, you're someone like my wife who seems to constantly run hot, or if you commute into the city through the summer, then I think it, there's a different case. You might well be the kind of rider who is going to benefit from a mesh jacket. Historically, one of the problems that we have had with mesh jackets is that they are not particularly protective, they're not particularly safe to wear. The good thing is that now under EN 17092, a mesh jacket will have to meet the minimum A standard and will have to come with armour. So you're going to have armour in a jacket like this in the elbows and the shoulders. This particular one, there's a back protector as well. But if you were going to have an accident at 70 miles an hour on the motorway, if you were going to fall off, then a mesh jacket would not be the jacket that I'd want to be riding. But recently, a new kind of stronger and I think better mesh jacket has come to the fore. And I'm talking about jackets like the Rucker Force Air. It was Rucker who first invented this new concept with the Force Air jacket made from a pretty heavy duty Cordura that was knitted instead of being woven as in a normal a jacket. This is one called the Klim Marrakesh. It's particularly lovely because not only has it got the 
Cordura, and this one is made of a thousand denier Cordura. It's got stretching, so it's superbly comfortable. There's another jacket from Klim called the Baja S4, which is th this jacket. These jackets are much more protective, but the real benefit of them, other than being more protective, is that every single panel flows air. So whereas with a mesh jacket, if you're going somewhere really hot, a mesh jacket will flow some air through wherever the panels are. Every single panel of this jacket will flow air. So they are more protective. I think they're better, they're nicer to wear, but by the same token, of course, they tend to be more expensive. There is, however, another application for a jacket like this or a mesh jacket, and that is if you ride off-road. The problem is that a traditional mesh jacket is not really cut for riding off-road. It's not very flexible. They tend to fit quite tightly. They're not made of the best fabric, so there's not a lot of stretch in them. But a jacket like this, of course, coming from someone like Klim, this was designed initially as an off-road jacket. So if you're riding hard off-road and you're generating a lot of heat, or if you're going adventure riding and you're riding somewhere hot, this is a fabulous jacket to wear. I went to Morocco a couple of years ago, and this is the jacket that, that I wore. So I don't take back what I said earlier on. I think that for most people, a mesh jacket is going to be a kind of luxury. Although, dependent on the person you are and the kind of riding you do, you may find one of value. All I can say is if you've got a mesh jacket and you think in the middle of the day, this is a wonderful way to ride, just be careful because when you come home in the evening and the sun has set, a mesh jacket, unless you've got something underneath it or over the top of it, a mesh jacket will cause you to simply freeze. Okay, let's now talk about what we call summer jackets, lightweight summer jackets. No two ways about it, a mesh jacket is going to be the most breathable, coolest jacket you can wear. But as we have intimated, for some people, a mesh jacket can simply be too chilly, too cooling, can flow too much air. And even on a summer's day here in Britain, a mesh jacket may not be totally appropriate. And if that worries you, if you're someone who doesn't like to run cold, you might want to look at a jacket like this, what we call a summer jacket. A jacket like this will not have a waterproof membrane. It's going to be super nice to wear in warm weather. And the reason being that because it doesn't have a waterproof membrane, it doesn't have a windproof membrane. In fact, a waterproof membrane and a windproof membrane are pretty much the same thing. So the fact that this jacket isn't waterproof is gonna allow the air to flow into this jacket. There's gonna be little to stop the oncoming air reaching the body. Okay, it has to be admitted that it's not gonna be quite as good as a mesh jacket because a mesh jacket's got the very broad mesh on it and that's gonna allow more air in, but by the same token, that can be a good thing if it's a little bit cooler. The good news with jackets like this is that they are just really easy to wear. They're rather like a jacket you might buy on the high street. So this particular jacket called the Kenya Evo from Furigan is a dead ringer for the Barracuda jacket, the Harrington jacket that Steve McQueen wore back in the 60s. It's a fully armored, it's a proper motorcycle jacket. It meets the required EN17092 standards, but you could get off the bike, walk into a pub wearing a jacket like this, and no one is gonna know that you're a biker. There are lots of jackets like this on the market. Another one of our favorites is the Raymond from Rucker. We call jackets like this kind of throw on jackets, kind of jacket that you keep in the hallway. If you just want to jump on the bike, you don't want to put all the gear on, but you just want to pop out to the shops maybe or, or go out for a bacon sandwich and you don't want all the paraphernalia. You put a jacket on like this, you're still properly protected, but they're really easy to wear both on and off the bike. I have to bear in mind the downside to jackets like this, as with a mesh jacket, they're gonna be pretty useless in the rain. Now, on some jackets, you might get a PU coating, and a, a coating gives you a reasonable amount of waterproofing. Depending on the jacket, that could give you up to an hour's waterproofing. We prefer to call these jackets, we never wanna claim that they're waterproof, we'd prefer to say water resistant. A jacket like this has a durable water repellent, that's gonna be good for half an hour or so. So, depends on the jacket, but you cannot rely on wearing a jacket like this in heavy rain, that's not what they're about. So the window for a summer jacket of this sort, a summer jacket without a waterproof membrane, is fairly narrow. But sometimes they're gonna be the nicest and most comfortable way to ride. Good news also is jackets like this are very rarely expensive because there's no membrane, there's no complicated taping to seal the seams as it were. They are not expensive to make and normally therefore they're not expensive to buy. And my view is that every biker needs a jacket like this somewhere in the wardrobe. What I want to talk about now are jackets with removable membranes. Jackets like this, this is the Moira from the Swedish brand Halvarsons. We know them as adventure jackets. And I would contend, once again, that jackets like this are not really 
aimed at markets like ours, at the UK market. And that may seem strange to some because let's face it, just about every other BMW GS rider is running around in an adventure jacket like this. But the truth is that they are more about hot weather riding and for riding off-road than they are for riding around in a climate like ours. But jackets like this do have a certain versatility. They have a wide range of uses. So let's say that you're out on an adventure. Not in the UK, I would suggest, but you're in Morocco, you're in South America, you're in the desert, you're climbing up a hill on the Baja Thousand, you're getting incredibly hot for one reason or another. You want to have a jacket without a waterproof membrane because a waterproof membrane is a windproof membrane. That's the last thing you want anywhere near your body when it's really hot. So very simply, you remove the membrane. That means that air is gonna pass through because there's nothing blocking the air. Adventure jackets are also renowned for having lots of vents. So jacket like this, you've got big vents here, vents up the arms, vents in the back. That means that the incoming air is gonna cool you down. By the same token, you're gonna be able to sweat. We've discussed sweat being the way that the body naturally cools itself down. This is going to be a very cool jacket to wear once the membrane's removed. But on your adventure, a few hours later, it starts to rain. So you stop, you zip this in, and then suddenly, you've got a waterproof jacket. And that might, may seem perfect. You've got the best of both worlds. But actually, we are not totally, com totally convinced that that's the best way to go about the changing conditions. And personally, what we would want is to have a jacket where we could wear the waterproof on the outside of the jacket. So in my mind, I have something in mind like the Klim Marrakesh or maybe the Klim Baja. And what I would do, I would wear that in hot conditions and then I'd put the Scott waterproof on over the top. And that I think is a better solution because what's going to happen with a jacket like this if it rains for a couple of hours and then stops you're going to have to continue riding on your adventure in a soaking wet jacket if you have something like the marrakesh you put the scot on over the top it rains for a couple of hours it stops raining you take the scot off you pack it in your bag you're then riding in a totally dry jacket so we think that that is a better solution if you are a proper adventure rider and when we look at jackets like this, we kind of look at them as the jack of all trades and master of none. In terms of riding in a jacket like this in the UK, the reality is that there are not that many days where you need to remove the membrane from a jacket because, again, waterproof and windproof, there aren't that many days where it's so hot that you cannot wear a jacket with a membrane. There is another issue with zip-out membranes in a jacket like this. In some ways, they are the least waterproof of waterproof jackets. And that's very simply because what happens is, in heavy rain, this jacket, the whole chassis of the jacket, is going to become soaking wet. Now, normally in a waterproof jacket, the seams of the membrane are taped to stop water coming through. But in a jacket like this, the liner is attached to the jacket with a zip. And if the jacket is wet, that water can come through the zip and reach the body. So it's not a fantastic solution. And those who think that they can ride in this jacket all winter, that they found one jacket, that they can ride all year round, are often sadly disappointed. These jackets are not especially waterproof. But in defense of jackets like this, what I would say is they're not a bad starting point for a solution that really is all year round. And it's very simple to convert this jacket into something that is all year round. I would, in most instances, be throwing away the inner liner. I would equip a jacket like this with a Scott waterproof so that when it rained or was cold, I would put that on the outside. When it was hot, I would take it off and then I've got the benefit of the vents. When it was really cold, I would want another solution. I'd want a thermal solution. So I'd be going for something like the Klim Maverick or the Rucker Down X. And then I would have literally the best of all worlds because I'd be covered in the cold with the down jacket, I'd be covered in the wet with a scot on the outside, and when it was just hot, I would have the vents here. So as they stand, adventure jackets are not all that they appear to be, but as a starting point for a universal system, they're pretty good. Now it's time for ice cream. Or maybe some nuts. A cool glass of orange. Why not try a hot dog? Or the real thing, a cool, refreshing Coca-Cola. From the sales staff and in the foyer, now.
This is the Veen jacket from the Swedish brand Halvarsons. Probably our favorite motorcycle jacket across the business. And it's what we call a drop liner jacket. We reckon that probably, I don't have the official stats, but probably in the UK, over 90% of waterproof jackets that are sold in this country are what we would call a drop liner jacket. So a drop liner jacket has a waterproof membrane. It's a waterproof membrane that cannot be removed. It is stitched into the jacket. A lot of people get confused because they hear the word drop liner and assume that what that means is you can drop the waterproof liner out of the jacket. We've seen those jackets, they're called removable waterproof jackets or removable liner jackets, but a drop liner is fixed into the jacket and where it is in the jacket, it's sewn into the jacket and then along those lines, along those seams, it is taped to stop water coming in through the sew holes. A drop liner is actually called a drop liner because where is in the jacket, it hangs down. In this case, from the shoulders, in a pair of trousers, it hangs from the, the waist. So the membrane hangs down or drops down. That's why it's called a drop liner membrane. Drop liner jackets are normally incredibly comfortable. They are certainly more comfortable than other forms of, or the other main form of waterproofing of a jacket. We'll come on and talk about that in some detail, but more comfortable than what we call a laminated jacket. And the reason is that the membrane hangs down, as I've mentioned, inside the outer fabric. So this is the outer fabric of the jacket. The waterproof membrane hangs down. And what happens, they kind of move together. They kind of mold around the body. So it makes the jacket very comfortable to wear. Another benefit of the drop liner system is that they are fairly inexpensive to make. Clearly, it's more complicated and more complex than making a non-waterproof jacket. But when we're talking about the other system, which again, we'll come on to, lamination, that's much more expensive, much more complicated, much trickier. But a drop liner jacket is fairly easy to put together. And therefore, you can buy relatively inexpensive waterproof jackets with a drop liner membrane. The other thing that you get with a drop liner membrane is a natural level of warmth. And again, even though I've not gone into depth yet and talked about laminated jackets, I have to compare it with a laminated jacket. In a laminated jacket, which we'll come on and discuss, you laminate or heat seal the membranes to the outer fabric. In this jacket, it hangs down. And in that gap between the outer fabric and the waterproof membrane, you've got an air gap and that holds air. So naturally, in its natural state, a drop liner jacket is more warm or warmer to wear than a laminated jacket. And what I would be suggesting is that you can wear a jacket like this, perfectly comfortable, up until the mid-20s. Now, at that point, it is true, and we've already discussed, that doesn't happen a lot in the UK, but at that point, a drop liner jacket, a jacket like this, is going to become a little bit sweaty, a little bit sticky. But as we said, that doesn't happen a lot. But our view is that for most riders, most of the time, for 90% of riders, a drop liner jacket is going to be the perfect kind of jacket to wear. It is comfortable, it is dry, and it will keep you warm. But nothing is perfect. There are some downsides to the drop liner construction, and I'm going to discuss those. They're the other side of the coin, as it were. Before I go into those, I need to explain how a membrane works. A membrane is a film. It's got millions of little holes, and I'm simplifying things here, but it's the only way I understand it, really. It's got millions of holes, and those holes are so small that the sweat can escape from the body. So we sweat, that becomes vapor, it turns from a liquid state into a gaseous state. That can pass through the membrane, but the holes are so small that the raindrops that want to come in, the cold rain that wants to come in from the outside, that can't pass through. So that's what a membrane does. It stops the water coming in, but it allows us to sweat and keep ourselves cool. In some ways, the easiest way of creating a waterproof jacket would just be to put a polythene sheet inside the outer fabric. That would make this jacket, or make a jacket, particularly waterproof. But because we couldn't sweat, because our vapor couldn't escape, we'd just end up getting wet from the inside. It would be horribly uncomfortable. It would defeat the purpose of a waterproof jacket in the first place. However, what's going to happen is this. After you are riding for two, three, or four hours, the jacket is going to keep you dry. The water will start to seep in this outer fabric but the membrane will stop it reaching the body. So two, three, four hours, you are going to remain dry. But after, say, three hours, depending on the heaviness of the rain, you will start to feel as though you're wet. You're not actually wet, but you're feeling wet because the outer jacket will have become soaking wet. Water will have gone in this outer layer. It'll be swilling around between the outer layer and the membrane. 
it reaches eventually a stage that we call wet out. It's just a soaking wet sodden jacket. Again, you should not feel wet, but you might feel cold because there's all this water around. Jacket will become heavy. It will become slightly uncomfortable. The other thing that happens is the wind chill factor as you're driving along, because if it's raining for that long, one assumes that it's fairly cold. The, that cold air at 60, 70 miles an hour, whatever it is, that chills this layer of water. That's going to start to make you feel very cold. Hopefully not wet, but you will feel very cold. The other thing that happens in tandem with that is, if this is wet, body heat transmits or conducts through a wet medium far faster than through a dry medium. So not only is the cold water on the outside making you feel cold, but your body heat is escaping much faster. And if the temperature drops even further and you're riding at night, then hypothermia, frankly, is only a few miles down the road. Now, that's an extreme situation. Not many of us, in truth, we may think that we might do living here in England, but not many of us find ourselves that often riding in three, four, five hours of rain. But the problem for those who do is that once the jacket has reached this stage that we call wet out, it can take that jacket and age to dry out. So let us say you've gone off on a tour. You leave Calais in the morning, you're riding all the way to Lyon in the south of France, and it is peeing with rain the whole time. You reach your hotel, feeling a wee bit chilly, you take the jacket off, you hang it up, it will still be wet in the morning. So in the morning, you're going to have to embark on the second day of your tour in a wet jacket. And nobody wants to do that. The other group of people who will find a limit or find the limits to a drop liner jacket are those who commute, who have a long commute every day. I'm not talking about a 10 or 15 minute commute, but if you commute for, say, an hour. In an hour, if it rains heavily, this jacket is not going to reach that wet out stage that I've spoken about, but the jacket will certainly get damp. So you arrive in work, you take the jacket off, it's a wee bit wet, it still won't dry or won't be bone dry by the time you leave eight hours later. So when it comes to put the jacket on in the evening at six o'clock on a cold winter's night, you're going to be putting on a wet jacket. And that just isn't nice because, again, you're going to be facing the wind chill effect. To have a cold jacket with that wind chill effect is going to make you feel uncomfortable. So the other group of riders who really at times can benefit from the other form of construction that I'm going to talk about, laminated construction, the other group of people who don't like drop liners or find the limit to drop liners of people who commute good distances every day. So in summary, drop liner jackets, they work for most people most of the time. The, as someone who's been riding, I don't ride huge miles, but I ride about 10 to 15,000 miles a year. I've been riding for many years. I can only remember one or two occasions where I've ever found the limit to a drop liner jacket. It just does not happen to most people most of the time. So for most of us, a drop liner jacket is just going to be the nicest, comfortable, most comfortable, most affordable solution. But if you are in that other group where you are out on the road a lot, if you go touring and you can easily spend all day on the road, or if you're someone who commutes a decent distance or a decent time every day, then you may find that a drop liner jacket isn't going to work for you. I want to talk now about wax cotton jackets. This is a wax cotton jacket. It's made by Bell Staff, the British brand. It's a jacket called the Crosby. For hundreds of years, people have been impregnating cotton garments, jackets and trousers with wax to make them waterproof. So we're talking about farmers, adventurers, soldiers, sailors. You take the cotton fabric, you spread wax all over it. It blocks the pores to stop the water from coming in. And it also, obviously, the wax repels water in its own right. So it does create a very waterproof garment. And in the early days of motorcycling, that's pretty much what a bell staff jacket and a barber jacket were. That's what they did. They were just cotton jackets with a smearing of wax to keep the water out. That works really well until the wax dries out. And when the wax dries out, it's why you, you often take your wax cotton jacket or you can take your wax cotton jacket to be re-waxed because when the wax dries out, suddenly the jacket is not waterproof at all. Thankfully, however, these days, the wax cotton is not the sole barrier to water ingress. A proper modern motorcycle jacket, a proper modern wax cotton motorcycle jacket will also have a membrane. And that makes a wax cotton motorcycle jacket, a waterproof wax cotton motorcycle jacket, really, really waterproof because you have two barriers that are preventing the rain from coming in. 
you've got the wax, which as long as the wax hasn't dried out, is a barrier to the rain and the wet. You then have the membrane. So a wax cotton jacket, a good wax cotton jacket, will pretty much never wet out. There is a downside, and it comes, it's the other side of the coin, as we've seen with a number of these jackets. The upside, it doesn't wet out. The downside is it makes for a jacket that's not particularly breathable, because we've discussed that when it's hot, we need the cool air to reach the body to cool us down. We need our sweat to escape as vapour. But if you've got both the membrane and a wax cotton outer, then that's going to prevent the incoming air. It's going to prevent the sweat. A wax cotton jacket can become pretty unpleasant when it's hot. The heavier the wax cotton, the hotter that jacket is going to be. So this is something like a six ounce wax cotton. So if you had a four ounce wax cotton, that's going to be pretty nice in the summer. Go to something like a 10 or a 12 ounce wax cotton on the Bellstaff trial mast and you've got something that's going to work in the winter, but is going to be almost unbearably hot in the summer. I would say that even though this is an aesthetic that at times suits the kind of adventure look, this is not the kind of jacket you would wear on a proper adventure if you were going somewhere and crossing a desert. I wore one once in South America and I thought I'd put on a bit of British style to show them how it was done. I have to tell you, it did not end well. Normally, the reason we choose a wax cotton jacket is for its aesthetic. There's a classic look about a wax cotton jacket and if you've got a genuine classic or some kind of retro classic or a modern retro, then a wax cotton is gonna look fantastic and there aren't really many trade-offs other than the ones that I've mentioned. They're gonna be fully C approved, they'll come with armor and so on. As a motorcycle garment, they will work, a good wax cotton jacket will work really well for, for example, winter commuting because it's so waterproof. And if you put something really warm beneath a jacket like this, so let's say the Rucker Down X Downs jacket, that will see you through most of the winter. Might not be as good in the summer, but as a winter commuting outfit, we have a lot of clients who will commute in wax cotton and it actually works really well. Bottom line, we really love wax cotton. It's normally very stylish because the people who are putting together wax cotton jackets, they have that aesthetic in mind. They are created to look like this to work on old looking bikes. The other thing about wax cotton, partly because of that, is that they work great off the bike. So you can get off the bike and walk into the fanciest West End restaurant and no one's going to stop you at the door because you like a biker. Because this is a style that's very fashionable as well. Bell Stuff is obviously a high fashion brand. So you can go anywhere in a jacket like this. All we'd say is, if you're going to get a wax cotton jacket, particularly a heavy one, do not set off on a big adventure, say for example, through South America, wearing a wax cotton jacket, like the film star Ewan McGregor did. So now, eventually we reach that point in the presentation where I talk about laminated jackets. I've alluded to laminate jackets in the past. They represent the pinnacle of sophistication in terms of motorcycle jacket construction. The jacket I've got on is the Navala jacket from the Finnish brand Rucker. It is a fantastic jacket. Normally, as I'll come on and discuss, laminate jackets are for various reasons quite uncomfortable. This one isn't because the entire jacket is infused with stretch. It's the only laminate jacket there is, and it's by far and away the most comfortable laminate jacket on the market. If this is a jacket you know and you've always been hankering after one, I would say go for it quickly. It's being discontinued this year. There are no more production slots for it. So when the UK's stock of Nivala jackets and pants run out, you won't be able to get any more. And then everyone's going to regret it because there has never been a jacket as comfortable as this, a laminated jacket as comfortable as this. I know what's coming from Rucker next year. It doesn't have stretch in. It's not going to be like the Nivala. So I think we know already that Laminate jackets are constructed differently. You have the outer fabric, and whereas in a drop liner jacket you have the membrane hangs down loosely, on a laminate jacket it is bonded onto the inside of the outer fabric. In fact, in this jacket, which really is the pinnacle, you then have a third layer. This jacket has what's called a Gore-Tex Pro Shell construction, so it's a three layer laminate. It really doesn't get better than this. But when you bond this membrane, be it a two layer or a three layer, when you bond those fabrics together, you create a certain degree of stiffness. So by and large, this jacket accepted. By and large, laminate jackets are not comfortable. And if I put on another rucker jacket, I would find it much less pleasant to wear because as you move your arms about, if you, as you move in it, you can hear it crinkle, you can hear a kind of crunchiness to it. That's a feature of most laminate jackets, but the guys who really need laminate jackets are prepared to accept that compromise for the benefits it brings them. Now, because 
it's got the membrane laminated up against the outer fabric. Water can't get in. When we were discussing drop nylon jackets, we acknowledged that water could come in. You don't get wet, but water swirls around, can make you feel cold, can make you feel wet. But in a laminate jacket, because the water can't pass through the membrane, it can't get into the jacket at all. So the jacket just stays drier. That does not necessarily mean that a laminate jacket is more waterproof. Both constructions will keep you dry because you can have a Gore-Tex membrane in a laminate jacket, you can have a Gore-Tex membrane in a drop liner jacket. Both work on the same principle of not allowing the rain to, to come in. So, a laminate jacket does have advantages. As I said, water cannot pass into the fabric. So a laminate jacket will not become sodden and heavy. It will not reach that stage that we've already spoken of. A laminate jacket will never wet out. And that has a couple of implications. A laminate jacket will actually be warmer in the rain because if you're riding along on a cold day and it's raining hard, because the jacket has not absorbed as much water, you will stay drier. I've already said that drop liner jackets are warmer, in, warmer than laminate jackets, but the difference is if you're out in a drop liner jacket and it's been pelting with rain and that's taken on all the water, a drop liner jacket will feel cold. So a drop liner jacket is warmer in the dry, a laminate jacket is, in theory, warmer in the rain. But perhaps the main benefit of a laminate jacket is because it doesn't take on as much water, it dries out so much faster. That's why laminate jackets are really popular with long-distance commuters. So based where we are here in Guildford, we have a lot of people who ride from Guildford or even south of Guildford into the West End or the city every day. They may have a commute of an hour to an hour and a half. If it rains, Throughout that journey, in a drop liner jacket, they would be arriving at their offices with a wet jacket. But with a jacket like this, it won't have taken on the water. They take it off, they hang it up. This jacket will be dry in an hour or so, whereas, as we've already mentioned, a drop liner might still be wet in the evening. It's why laminate jackets are sometimes very popular with those guys who do a lot of touring, because for the same reason, you've spent six hours in the rain, seven hours in the rain, whatever it is, it's rained all day. Drop liner jacket will still be wet in the morning. Take this off, it'll be dry in a few hours. In the morning, you're going to be putting on a warm jacket. There's another advantage to a laminate jacket, and that is that the vents work better. In a laminate jacket, when you've got a vent opening, because the membrane is bonded to the outer fabric, the air is then going to pass right through to the body. So the venting is much more effective on a laminate jacket. When you have a vent in a drop liner jacket, you've got the membrane, you've got a vent here that opens up, the air has still got to pass through the, the membrane. It still has a cooling effect, but it cannot be denied that the vents on a laminate jacket are just going to work better. Of course, you can still get hot in a laminate jacket. It's not, there's nothing magic about a laminate jacket. And like a drop liner, if it's really hot, the membrane is going to stop the sweat escaping, and in all conditions, it's going to stop cold air reaching the body. So there are still obvious downsides. The others are, if we just run through them, a laminate jacket is going to be, in principle, this jacket accepted, less comfortable to wear, it's going to be stiffer. They are complex to make, so they're going to be more expensive. You don't tend to find many cheap laminate jackets. And when you do find a laminate jacket that is too cheap, they tend not to work. So our view is, if you are in that group or in one of those groups, if you do a lot of touring and you're often going to be or reckon you're going to be on the bike in the rain all day, you might consider a laminate jacket. If you're a long distance commuter, commuting for an hour plus every day through the winter, then I think there comes a point where a laminate jacket is a must have. For the rest of us, honestly, a laminate jacket just isn't necessary. So, as we have seen, there are lots of different types of jacket construction. But what you have to accept is that no one jacket does everything. And most experienced bikers, most people who have been biking for a while, will end up with more than one jacket that they're going to use for different purposes or at different times of the year. Clearly, we all have our personal preferences. There's no rights or wrongs. I've been expressing some opinions, but other people will disagree with those opinions. We know guys, for example, who will ride all year round. They will commute in leather all year round, and they're fine with that. They'll get used to it, and what they'll do, they will accept the downsides because so highly do they rate the upsides that they will just balance it up and say, I'm happy in leather. But every style, naturally, every style of construction has its 
own strengths and weaknesses. Leather, in our view, looks really cool, it's comfortable, and it's abrasion resistant, but it doesn't have a very wide window of usage. Mesh jackets and jackets without membranes, again, narrow window of opportunity, but fantastic in hot weather, and normally not particularly expensive. Jackets with removable waterproof membranes look fantastic on an adventure bike. They offer a certain degree of versatility, but they still won't do everything. And if you think that you can take a, an adventure jacket and commute through a British winter in it, then I think you could be in for a bit of a surprise. Drop liner jackets, as we've mentioned, we feel are best for 90% of riders. They are waterproof, they are warm, they are comfortable, and they are not necessarily expensive. Yes, in extreme cases, they will wet out, but you have to ask yourself, how often have you historically found yourself riding in three, four, five hours of rain, or how often do you think you are going to find yourself in three, four, five hours of rain? It doesn't happen to us a lot. For some, a laminate jacket is the answer, but there are downsides. There are some upsides, but there are some downsides. They're not usually cheap. They're not usually comfortable. They're not usually naturally warm, but the advantage is they won't wet out they will dry out much faster. And I suppose what I would say in conclusion on laminate jackets is they are an unnecessary luxury in our book for someone who's doing below 10,000 miles. If you're doing below 5,000 miles, you really don't need a laminate jacket. If you're doing 10,000, you're reaching the point where a laminate jacket starts to make sense. If you're riding over 15,000 miles a year, then in our view, it's exactly the opposite. You should get yourself a laminate jacket. So I hope you found some of that informative. If you want to look at our range of jackets, then visit the website motolegends.com. If you end up buying a jacket, you should know that we make the process as simple, straightforward and risk-free as we possibly can. There's no delivery charge on any item of protective wear that you buy from us. Returns are totally free and what's more, we give you a full 12 months in which to decide whether you do want to return something to us. Now we have the best price promise in the, in the business. John Lewis is rightly famed for its never knownly undersold. Price promise, we go one stage better. If you can find another retailer sending anything that we sell at a price that is lower than ours, we will beat that retailer's price by a full 10%. There are a few terms and conditions, nothing particularly onerous, but if you are going to price beat us, as we call it, then visit the website and check out what those terms and conditions are. If in the future you'd like to receive bulletins from us about new products, or indeed with how-to guides like this, then if you go to the website at the top of every page, there's a piece of script that says newsletter sign up, click on there, within seconds you'll be in business, in future you'll receive all of our email bulletins. If you prefer to get your information video graphically, that is to say in this form, then we would be delighted if you wanted to become a subscriber to our YouTube channel, and you can do that by clicking on the button below. Now, this is 2021. Last year, 2020, we gave away to a YouTube subscriber a Mutt 125cc motorbike. We had customized it to look a little bit like a Steve McQueen at Desert Sled. This year, 2021, we're going a little bit upmarket. We're going to be giving away a 250cc Fantic Caballero Scrambler. We're going to be giving it away just before Christmas, but we're not going to be giving it away this year to a YouTube subscriber, but rather to somebody who follows us on Facebook. So if you want to stand a chance of winning this fabulous little bike, then pop over to Facebook and obviously follow us. Finally, I'd like to make a play for a little shop here at Motor Legends. We're based about a mile from the centre of Guildford, a mile from the railway station. And as I say, the shop is quite small. It's got a small footprint but it's attached to our warehouse where we have more than two million pounds worth of gear arranged over three floors. Technically makes this the second largest motorcycle apparel shop in the UK. But we think that we are far more than just the amount of merchandise we have here in the building. We're all about service, we're all about personal fitting. If you wanna check us out, visit Trustpilot. We have the highest five-star ranking in the business. And when you come and see us, we'll serve you only the finest Italian Illy coffee, or we'll serve you proper Yorkshire tea in a proper teapot. And who knows, if you're lucky, you might even get to sample one of our delicious motorcycle-shaped shortbread biscuits. Anyway, this has been Chris. I hope to talk to you again soon.